So today we're going to talk about optical imaging and this is really cool. This is like the one, well, one of two, two techniques, imaging techniques I haven't actually done, PET being the other, um, but it's what I really want to do and I think it's really cool. And uh, I actually, since writing the chapter on it, I want to do it more than I ever did before. Um, so the idea of optical imaging is just shining light uh, through the skin and in the case of brain imaging through the skull and recording what's going on. And it's actually the same technology that's used in things like the Apple Watch for measuring pulse uh, and blood oxygenation. Or if you've ever been to the hospital and had one of these little things clips put on your thumb, um, it's the same thing. It's using light uh, to do this recording. So it's a pretty standard technique and pretty widespread, right? It's in consumer devices, uh, but it can also be used for brain imaging. And in fact, there's a company in Halifax, uh, Axum Neurotechnology, who are developing uh, this technique for brain imaging for a specific purpose. So um, if you haven't met these guys, Chris is currently a PhD student in Sean Bowe's lab. So he's uh, in uh, psychology and neuroscience. And his co-founder, Tony Ingram, also a PhD student. And then Mike Lawrence is a recent PhD graduate from our program. Um, and they had the idea of creating a near-infrared uh, system specifically for doing neurofeedback. And they've gone back and forth between two different ideas, but the one they're focused on right now is for rehabilitation after stroke, and especially motor rehab. Uh, one of the issues that people with uh, stroke often have, if, if it affects the motor cortex, is they have trouble moving one limb. Uh, contralateral to where the damage is. And one of the things that can actually help uh, quite a lot <coughs> is just uh, practicing mental practice. So imagining moving the, the affected limb. Even if you can't actually move it, it turns out that imagining moving it drives the right kind of neural activity that will facilitate recovery and can actually be really effective because again, you know, if you have limited movement or no movement, obviously you can't actually make those movements, or even if you have limited movement, it might be exhausting to do it for very often or for very long. But if you imagine doing it, you can actually drive recovery faster. The problem is that if you don't get any sort of feedback about what you're doing, it's not very exciting to sit there and imagine moving your arm, especially when it's not moving. So the idea is by decoding motor cortex activity, they can actually turn that into a, a neurofeedback thing where you can see the level of engagement of your motor cortex wrap that into a game or something that keeps people motivated and, and practicing. Uh, so this is from our, our uh, Neuro Hackathon weekend. They came and did a demo. So that's the prototype uh, near system that they have there, which goes right over the motor cortex. It's very cool. So I just thought it was neat that uh, there's a company of students from this department in Halifax uh, who are developing this technology. And they've really, rather than taking something off the shelf, they've built it from scratch. They were actually in China for several months at a hardware accelerator working on the design um, and have uh, apparently solved some issues that we'll talk about today um, around the technology and have uh, come up with some, some neat ideas and some uh, uh, pending patents and so on. So pretty cool stuff. So really what we're doing here is shining light from emitters into the head and they follow these banana shaped paths through the head and get picked up at detectors uh, elsewhere. And so the light has to pass through the skin, through the scalp, through the skull, and penetrate into the brain, and then bounce back. And the, the real limitations here are that obviously our skulls are not transparent. Um, it turns out that when we use infrared light, the skulls are somewhat transparent uh, to infrared light. And even like if you were to hold your hand up, it's not really sunny enough today, but if you were holding your hand up outside on a sunny day, you can kind of see this red fringe around the edge of your hands, and that's because the red light and the infrared light pass through your body better than other colors of light. And so that's the phenomenon there. So it turns out that the light will go through the skull. Uh, it doesn't penetrate too deeply. Um, you could, in principle, uh, uh, shine light deeper into the head. The issue is that light has to have a certain amount of energy to penetrate deeper, and there's safety limits on that. So you, you know, in order to penetrate deeper, you'd basically be putting the person at risk of frying their brain, which we don't want to do. So we keep the, the white levels uh, to very safe levels. So that's the principle. I'll come back to the, the details later. Um, <clears throat> the history here, although it's not a terribly widely used technique at this point, it actually goes back quite a ways. So it was really in World War II, 
1940s that uh, the principle of spectrophotometry on which near-infrared imaging is based was developed not for brain imaging but just for measuring concentrations of substances uh, in test tubes by shining light through them. Um, and then Franz Jobsis in 1977 published the first paper uh, describing the application of this to uh, brain imaging. Uh, that's him, the top figure there. And it uh, uh, took him almost a decade to convince anybody to give him grant funding to actually do it, uh, which tells you how conservative grant funding uh, agencies tend to be. Uh, but did uh, get a grant in 1985. And then the first uh, papers showing convincing evidence of brain activity using this technique were published in 1993. What's interesting about that is that the first papers describing fMRI were only published in 1992. So this really has the sort of the same history, same length of time that it's been used and demonstrated in, in humans for brain imaging as fMRI. But you've probably seen a lot more fMRI papers out there than you've seen um, near infrared imaging papers. And uh, there's a few reasons for that. A lot of it is that it's, it's a pretty difficult technique to use and it relies on specialized hardware whereas MRIs relied on hardware that was already present in hospitals and were relatively easy to use, uh, relatively turnkey for researchers to come in and start doing it. And you get these pretty pictures of the brain and uh, with MRI you don't have to worry about like depth of penetration, right? So we get the whole brain with a functional MRI scan, whereas with near-infrared, we only get really the surface of the brain, as I was showing you with those banana-shaped paths. Uh, and so it's, it's limited in quite a few ways. Uh, but at the same time, it's far cheaper than fMRI. Uh, it doesn't cost millions of dollars. It costs probably tens of thousands of dollars. And it's quite portable. It uh, doesn't have the same contraindications as MRI in terms of you know, having metal in your body or implanted electronic devices or anything. So you can use it in people with pacemakers, cochlear implants, deep brain stimulators, all kinds of you know, dental work and so on. So there are quite a few advantages. Uh, one of the big ones and one of the big applications where this is used more widely is with children because it's relative resistant to head movement. Uh, compared to even EEG um, and, and it's, it's light and easily worn. So uh, a lot of infant researchers are, are quite interested in using this. Also, he doesn't have a bullet point there, but I, I'd like to um, mention Britton Chance, who was another key developer who, um, he died uh, quite recently in the 2000s. He was over 90 years old. So he was actually involved, he was trained by Glenn Milliken. Um, and involved in the development of uh, near-infrared spectroscopy and near-infrared imaging was actually, you know, actively building near-infrared brain imaging devices uh, in his lab and publishing papers up until his death in, in 1992. Um, so really energetic and productive uh, kind of guy. This is a field, um, and this may be part of why it's, it's <coughs> less, less common, or it may reflect the fact that the field is quite fragmented is there is quite a lot of different abbreviations and acronyms uh, to describe more or less the same thing. <coughs> Excuse me. So NEARS is, or FNEARS, is what most people call this technique, which stands for Near Infrared Spectroscopy, or functional. Um, I prefer FNEARI uh, because it stands for Functional Near Infrared Imaging, which is really what we're doing. Under the hood, you are kind of doing spectroscopy, but uh, it's, it's really brain imaging at this point and not just measuring concentration in a test tube. Um, your NEARS is still the more common one that you'll probably hear. Um, maybe with the publication of my book, the world will change. Maybe not. We'll see. Um, uh, some people call it diffuse optical tomography. Uh, tomography there really means getting brain images. So as we'll see, what you get out of the system is really just time varying signals. So each of those light detectors will give you uh, a time varying signal of the, the strength of, of the light that you're receiving from it. Um, but you can do a form of source localization that will allow you to sort of see where in the brain the activity is occurring. And so at that point it becomes tomography when you're sort of representing it in the source space of the brain. Uh, OIS or optical imaging of intrinsic signals, another term that's used. And then EROS is event related optical signal and that specifically refers to the fast signal that we'll come to in a little bit. So using more or less the same hardware, but measuring uh, a slightly different thing. So what are we measuring? Well, in most cases, when we're doing FNIRI, we're measuring uh, what's called the slow signal, which is the hemodynamic response. Very similar to what we're measuring when we do fMRI. Uh, 
so remember the, the bold or blood oxygenation level dependent response is the slow change that takes after a stimulus onset typically two to three or even more seconds to come on, uh, ramps up, peaks after about six to eight seconds, and then comes back to baseline around 12 to 15 seconds after stimulus onset. And that's for sort of a transient stimulus as opposed to a, a sustained stimulus. Now, with fMRI, we get the bold signal, which is really the ratio of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin together. And if you think back to the fMRI lectures, there was, uh, you know, there's been quite a lot of investigation trying to figure out to what extent that's driven by oxygenated versus deoxygenated uh, changes. With fNERI, uh, because we're measuring, uh, as I'll talk about in a minute, from multiple wavelengths of light, we can actually get uh, separate measurements of the concentration of oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. And then we can combine them together in something we call total hemoglobin, go figure, uh, which is the most analogous to the fMRI bold response. Uh, but the cool thing is you can break it down. And in fact, one of the key studies uh, by Malinek and Grinwald that help to explain what the bold response is and the relative contributions of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin used optical imaging. Not, uh, not this non-invasive human form, but a, a variant where you, in, in animal models, uh, you can actually remove the skull and shine the light directly on the surface of the brain uh, and get these measurements. So you, your localization is obviously much more precise. Incidentally, you can do that in humans as well Obviously, you would only do it in a neurosurgical uh, situation, but uh, there are neurosurgical labs that use this uh, instead of or in conjunction with the electrical stimulation mapping that's, that's more commonly used. Um, so it can be used there, but today we're just talking about the, the non-invasive type. And you can also derive a measure of oxygen saturation, which is basically the concentration of oxygen in the blood uh, from this. So it's quite, quite a rich measure uh, in that way. And again, it's sort of, you know, uh, a, a poor version of, of fMRI in a sense because the, the signal's very comparable. The light that we're using, I've already said repeatedly, it's infrared light. So here's the, the spectrum of visible light from the ultraviolet range, which is sort of at the, the purple end that we can't see. You can see the visible spectrum. The infrared range is the, the range sort of just beyond red before you get into like radar and FM and very high frequency kinds of waveforms. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, it's the infrared light that really can penetrate through the body, and that's why these uh, wavelengths are used. Some of them are, uh, that are used in this technique are visible, uh, so they're sort of reddish shades of light, and other ones are, are not. Um, and in fact, some of the pulse oximeters, not for brain imaging, um, the lights actually look green, so the wavelengths are actually uh, quite different, um, working on a, a similar but slightly different principle. Uh, when we look at this, what we're seeing is the absorption of light as a function of the wavelength of light. So again, 400 to 700 is kind of the visible spectrum. And then down here is the ultraviolet. Up here is the infrared. And the, the different colored lines here are representing the absorption of light by different uh, compounds or chromophores. Chromophores is one of these annoyingly uh, scientific words uh, that just means stuff or substance, um, but in this context it's, it's, we're talking about them in terms of their light absorption. So they're called chromophores because they're, they're absorbing light. Uh, the wavelengths that we're using are in this optical window uh, for the, the near-infrared imaging. So in the sort of 700 to 8 to 900 range. And one of the important reasons to choose that range is that water doesn't actually absorb light in there. You can see water absorbs light uh, the UV range and in the higher IR range, but not in the, the near-infrared range. And because our bodies are, have such high concentrations of water, that's critical because it means our signal isn't affected by water. Uh, the other critical reason that people use wavelengths in this range, besides the fact that they go through the skull, which is a real bonus, is that uh, oxyhemoglobin, which is the red line here, and deoxyhemoglobin, which is labeled HHB here, and is the blue line, the dark blue line, um, they have different levels of absorption of light in, in this wavelength range. And critically, they cross at a point here. Uh, so where they cross is called the isobestic point, incidentally. Um, but what that means is that if you choose one wavelength of light that's kind of on the, the left side of the isobestic point, uh, it's more sensitive to the deoxyhemoglobin. And if you choose a second wavelength of light that's a little further over to the right, uh, 
you're more sensitive to the oxyhemoglobin, and that's how you're able to uh, recover the, the concentrations of each. And so in functional near-infrared imaging, you need a minimum of two different wavelengths of light uh, to be able to make these measurements so that you can differentiate the, the oxy and the deoxyhemoglobin. In fact, you can use more than two. Uh, people have used uh, up to five and investigated the efficacy of that. And uh, what this chart is showing is this from a paper where they basically reviewed lots of different papers that explored different wavelengths to try to get a sense of A, what wavelengths were most common, and B, uh, what were sort of the relative merits or, or demerits of different choices. Um, so basically with two wavelengths of light you can measure two chromophores, which would be oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. As you increase the number of wavelengths you can uh, detect more chromophores if you want to. And there are other things, if we jump back to that previous slide, um, things like cytochrome oxidase that are markers of metabolism and other cellular activity that might be interesting. Um, so in principle, although people primarily use NERI for the, the bold imaging, um, you could actually be looking at other metabolites as well. The big issue with this is that, again, the safety issue that you, you're limited in the total amount of light that you can beam into the head without causing damage. and that's summed across all of your wavelengths. So as you increase the number of different wavelengths you're using, you necessarily decrease the intensity of light at each wavelength, which means you get less penetration into the head, worse signal to noise, and weaker results overall. And so the vast majority of studies, especially like most of these were more exploratory technical kinds of studies, the studies that are actually trying to do brain imaging and functional brain imaging uh, almost universally use two wavelengths because that way you get the best signal to noise. And uh, what I've circled here is what are, seem to be the most common choices, which are 690 and 830 nanometers, uh, which are sort of the, the points that I was talking about before where you have one that's sensitive more to oxy, one that's more sensitive to, to deoxyhemoglobin. Um, you can see some of these actually use broad spectrum uh, sorts of things instead of narrow spectrum ones, but again, you have the sort of dilution of the intensity of the signal. Um, the other thing to, to note here is that you don't really, this sort of implies you have choice, but typically you don't have much choice because especially if you buy their various commercial systems that you can buy, they have these things uh, built in and the wavelengths are chosen by the, the hardware that is specified in those devices. So it's not like a switch that you can turn or something you, you've got, and I'll talk about the technology later uh, and why it's limited, but you, you really stuck with what they offer. And so um, if you have strong feelings about this, you would have to buy a system around it. Um, on the other hand, a lot of systems that are being used in research are actually custom built systems. Uh, which is another reason why this isn't one more widespread is there aren't a lot of commercial systems so a lot of people are building their own uh, and then they do have more flexibility around that. Okay, so again, we're shining light from emitters. They follow these ideally banana shaped paths that penetrate through the outer surface of the cerebral cortex, get picked up by detectors. Penetration depth uh, is about two to three centimeters. I'll come back to that uh, a little later in the lecture. Um, but that means that you can more or less, you know, and that's two to three centimeters total, not two to three centimeters into the brain. So remember that there's already a fair amount of distance through your scalp, through your skull, which is reasonably thick, the CSF under the skull and the meninges before you actually get to the cortex. And so the penetration into the cortex might actually be, you know, only one centimeter or something like that. So you're probably not getting down to the depths of even the bottom of most sulci when you're doing near infrared imaging. This, as I'll talk about later, does depend on how far apart the emitter and the de detector are. Um, but there are, again, limitations just by the strength of the, the light as well. And only about 3% of the light that goes in actually reaches the cerebral cortex and, and comes back out. Uh, a lot of light goes in other places. And so if you think about it, first of all, the hair uh, can be a barrier to light. So as you're putting these things on, you want to find ways to get through the hair. Uh, and that was one of the things that Axum, who I showed you before, uh, have focused on, is designing probes that are, are relatively small, and you can wiggle them and sort of part the hair, just the way when you do an EEG, you would use a syringe to part the hair to get the gel uh, right down to the scalp. Um, so they've developed sort of a similar technique for doing that. But the hair can be an issue, and especially people with dark hair or thicker hair are 
worse subjects for Neri than uh, somebody who's bald or has uh, thin or, or light colored hair. Um, the intervening tissues also absorb uh, a lot of light. And of course, we're measuring the signal from the blood, but it's not just the brain that has blood in it, right? There's, you know, your scalp has blood vessels going through it. And so that's going to contribute to the signal as well. And a lot of the light just sort of bounces off the skull or gets absorbed and goes in different directions. The other thing that's sometimes lost when you look at a, a picture like this, which is in two dimensions, is that of course the light, if you shine the light directly down into the head, it's going to go out in every direction from that. And so it sort of looks like the light just sort of goes in these two paths, but in fact it's going out in every direction. So any one sensor anywhere near that emitter is going to pick up, you know, a very small fraction uh, of the total light uh, that's going in. Uh, so it's, uh, it's limited in that way as well. So I've talked about the slow signal, the hemodynamic signal. The other signal that we can get with FNERI is the fast signal. And this is the one that's called Eros or event-related optical signals, uh, thus called because it's done typically like ERPs, so time lock to particular events uh, of interest. Uh, and it has a time course similar to EEG and MEG, so it's on the order of milliseconds. So at the bottom here, you can see an example from a paper uh, where they directly compared, so they put EEG and uh, optical uh, sensors on the head at the same time. And in this case, they were comparing visual responses, so BA17 is visual cortex, in younger and older adults, and showed a bigger effect for younger than older, uh, and a peak around 80 milliseconds. And then when they looked at the ERPs, at, so PZ, so, which they explain is sort of representing activity in the same area, uh, they found actually a, a negative peak here, um, which is still activation, of course, and then slightly later peaks and differences again uh, between the groups. Uh, the arrow signal here looks actually a little more convincing than the ERP signal. Um, but in the paper, they basically showed that uh, there was a, a correlation between these two signals, uh, which was important because just because you can shine light through the head and get some signal out doesn't mean it actually means anything, right? So it's nice to validate it against something that's kind of a, a gold standard there. Um, the mechanism here uh, that has been proposed and to some extent validated, although that's still a bit of an open question, is that uh, as the, the cells fire, their ion channels are opening and more liquid is rushing in and as a result the cells swell up. And so the amount of intracellular space in increases and critically the amount of extracellular space shrinks. So as the cells swell there's less space between them and the light is sort of going to preferentially go through the intercellular space and not the intracellular space. Um, so by cell, when the cells swell, they affect the, the light transfer through. Um, and so it's not measuring an electrical signal directly the way ERP or, or MEG does, but it's recording a signal that's driven by changes that are caused by these electrical changes, which is why they're occurring on, on a similar time scale. Eros is far less used than the slow signal in published uh, FNERI studies. Relatively few labs are doing it. It doesn't require entirely specialized hardware. You can actually use the same hardware for Eros or some of the same hardware for Eros that you can use uh, for regular hemodynamic imaging. Um, but the signal to noise ratio is quite low and there are relatively few labs that have been successful in, in doing this. Um, but those that have been successful have been continuously successful. But it's sort of interesting looking at the literature because they've actually had to go to fairly great lengths to prove themselves and to validate themselves um, because I think it's such a, a weak signal that some labs that have tried to replicate it have failed and felt that it wasn't a valid technique because they couldn't get it to work. Um, so it's um, is, you know, far from mainstream and, and not widely used, um, but becoming a little more widely accepted as more and more evidence comes out that you know, they can demonstrate these things and replicate them and so on. And so from the perspective of the technique, you know, if you had to buy one imaging technique, this might be a strong one to consider because you can get both sort of fMRI-like signals and ERP-like signals out of one set of hardware. Now, you know, slightly different settings maybe and uh, different analysis techniques, uh, but it, it certainly has that capability, which is kind of cool. Uh, I think this more or less uh, restates what I'd said before. 
except one of the biggest limitations of the Eros technique is a limitation of the current hardware for doing uh, near-infrared imaging, which is that the sampling rates are quite low. Uh, I'll talk a little more about this later, but basically um, the more channels that you have, so the more different light sources and, and detectors that you have, the lower your sampling rate has to be because you have to sample from them. You can't sample from them at the same time, you have to sample from them at different times. Uh, and so to get decent spatial resolution, you need lots of channels, but that decreases your sampling rate. And so in practice, the sampling rates that you see with f systems are typically around the order of 50 hertz. Whereas with EEG, you would typically be using like 250 or 500 or 1000 hertz, so much, much faster sampling. Um, that means you're only sampling 50 times a second, so you're not really getting millisecond resolution. You're only sampling um, you know, maybe every eight or, or 10 milliseconds or, or even slower. And so that when you're measuring a fast signal, that's an important limitation is it's, you can't measure actually that fast a signal. Uh, so, and remember that uh, the, if you think back to EEG, I talked about aliasing in the Nyquist frequency, which basically says that you can't actually, given your sampling rate, you can only really measure a signal that's about half or a third the frequency of your sampling rate. So in this case, if your sampling rate's 50 hertz, the best you can hope for is getting a 25 hertz signal and possibly only like 15 or 20 hertz uh, signal. Um, so, so those are relatively slow. That's sort of at the, you know, typically with EEG, we might filter at 30 hertz. And so you're losing even some of the higher frequency stuff that you would get in, in an EEG study. So that's a big limitation. On the other hand, you can get pretty fast stuff, which is what I'm trying to show with this figure which is where they had people alternately tapping their hands, um, their two hands. And so you're seeing a red line for contralateral motor cortex, which is um, you know, one side of the, the motor cortex and then ipsilateral. And uh, you can see that the contralateral is sort of going up and down, uh, synchronized with the finger taps of that hand. Um, and that's over the course of just, you know, 250 milliseconds. So, so that's pretty good temporal resolution. Uh, and obviously far better than you would get with fMRI or the slow hemodynamic signal. Okay, so how do we measure it? We use cats with laser eyes. I'm sorry, I just couldn't resist. Um, no, but we do, we can use lasers. Uh, so this is a commercial system, this is a company called uh, Nirx, N-I-R-X. And uh, you can see that the cap looks a lot like an EEG cap. And the optodes kind of look like EEG electrodes, not, but uh, same idea. So you've got some sort of little thinny, and it pops into receptacles on the hat, and then it's got a, a cord coming off it. In this case, the, it's not a wire, it's a fiber optic cable. And so you've got a device, like you can see on the cart here, that's actually generating the light and shining it through these fiber optic cables to the head. And then a critical thing is that because we're sending in light and measuring light, um, we need to shield the receptors or the, the detectors from the, the light in the room because that'll get picked up as well and wreck our, our signal to noise ratio. And so they, they plug into these things and everything's black to keep the light out and keep things uh, uh, as dark as possible in there. And at the same time, uh, try and keep these things still because although the system is in principle relatively resistant to head motion, as I said, if those uh, optodes, as they're called, are moving on the head, then the path of the white is actually moving, and then the intensity of the white that's going in is going to be affected quite sharply. And so um, they're not sensitive to like the, the muscle contractions or other things, or just the wires moving around, but the physical movement of those optodes relative to the scalp matters. So you need to keep those fixed in place uh, as securely as possible. One of the other cool things about this, uh, which is not super visible, but like right there under my pointer and right there, those are EEG electrodes. And so in this system, they actually have combined EEG and uh, uh, FNIRI uh, sensors in the same cap. And so you can use this regardless of whether you're using the fast or the slow signal measurements. Uh, you can get both uh, types of measurements at once. And this is possible because they're using it completely orthogonal signals. So there's nothing about sending in infrared light that's going to affect the electrical measurements, unlike, say, fMRI or, or something like that. Uh, and there's nothing about the electricity that affects the light, nothing about the light that affects the electricity. So they're really um, two different things that you can measure at the same time, uh, which is another kind of cool option if you want to have twice as much data to analyze. <coughs> 
Um, people often think these multimodal imaging studies are cool until they have a pile of data and they realize that there's a lot of data there. And it's often, you know, it's one thing to analyze each type of data separately, and then quite another thing to try and figure out how they actually combine uh, together. So good job for a PhD, not for an undergrad thesis. Uh, here's just examples of different systems um, that are found on the internet, uh, some of which look slicker than others. Uh, this is one uh, commercial system, and you can see that they've solved the problem of light not going through the hair by designing a system that doesn't go over the hair. It just measures light uh, brain activity through the forehead. And so it's really only good for measuring frontal lobe activity, um, but the, the frontal lobe turns out, you know, does some valuable stuff whole Phineas Gage thing, um, right? And so it's been used a lot in psychiatry and in studies of like working memory and things that involve the frontal lobe, but obviously that's fairly limiting. Um, this one's actually a system that was built by Honda. Um, so in spite of the fact that they mostly make cars, they have a, a basic R&D division. Um, this one, another system, and you can, what you can see in basically all of these systems is that they don't offer whole head coverage. And this is driven by a few limitations. One is just kind of the expense and the practicality of it. Uh, and the other relates to what I was talking about before, that the more s optodes you have, the lower your sampling rate becomes. Again, I'll explain in detail that in a minute. Um, but that means that to get whole head coverage, you'd need a lot of these sensors, which would end up being very expensive. And you would probably have a really terrible sampling rate unless you had uh, in fact, like maybe multiple different boxes that are all sort of doing the white stuff separately. Even then there's, there's some, some issues. Uh, so most systems are not whole head, but rather they cover a particular part of the head. This is pretty common here, like this one where you've just got this grid. And so you, you end up putting it over the part of the head that you're most interested in, uh, which is obviously a limitation, but also in, in a sense, it, it can be helpful because you have more sort of focused data collection and it makes you really think about which brain areas do we actually care about and have hypotheses about. Uh, so for instance, if you want to do motor cortex, then you just put it over motor cortex. If you want to do prefrontal cortex, put it over prefrontal. Uh, you can, like in this system here, which is kind of over her motor cortex, you can do two of them and put one over each motor cortex and at least you have the, the bilateral kinds of measurements. And as I mentioned, you know, so there's these sort of nice looking commercial systems, but there's also systems like this that are completely homebrewed and a lot of labs do that sort of thing. And they've obviously just used like a motorcycle helmet and drilled holes in it to put the, the optodes in. Uh, so a lot of different options there. This figure again. Um, actually, I'm not sure why this figure is here again. So we'll skip by it. Uh, so coming to how we measure it. There's three different technologies uh, that can be used uh, to do FNIRI, uh, continuous wave frequency modulation and time domain. And they basically sort of fall along a continuum in terms of the technical sophistication and uh, correlated with that how prevalent they are. So continuous wave is probably the most prevalent and the most widely available. It's in the most uh, commercially available systems. Uh, it's also the most limited in what it can tell you. Frequency modulation, um, so, and in particular, continuous wave cannot do the fast signal, only the slow signal. Frequency modulation, a little more complex, but there are commercial systems out there that do this, and it's able to do the fast signal. And I'm going to come and break the, each of these down in a minute. And then finally, time domain imaging is the most sophisticated. Uh, as far as I know, there's no commercially available systems. They're all custom-built, lab-based uh, kinds of solutions. Um, but it has some, some real advantages. And so I think, you know, it might take 20 years, uh, but it, it will likely become the most prevalent and best approach to, to doing FNIRI once all the details are figured out. So I'll come back to, to what each of those are. But what they all have in common is they all require some sort of light source, and they all can use the same kinds of light sources and light detectors, which is the next slide. So your light choices are basically lasers or LEDs, um, laser diodes, uh, LEDs or light emitting diodes. Uh, so each has some advantages and disadvantages. LEDs are becoming more and more prevalent because they're smaller. 
they have for more options in terms of wavelengths. And so before when I was talking about the choice of wavelengths, it's because the, the lasers and the LEDs are specific colors. So they, they're engineered to have a specific wavelength. And the good ones have a relatively narrow bandwidth, meaning that if it's labeled as a 690 nanometer LED, it's, uh, you know, it might be like 680 to 700, as opposed to 650 to 750 or something like that, which would be a wide bandwidth. So you want relatively narrow bandwidth because you get better sensitivity there, especially if you think back to the, the chromophore curves and the fact that they're, they're not flat, but they're sort of dipped at certain points. So you want to find the wavelengths that really maximize the difference between your oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. Um, so the LEDs have more wavelength options, so you can tune things a little better. Uh, they're safer because, safer of course, lasers, you know, you shouldn't point your laser at your eye and that sort of thing. Um, they can be relatively high intensity and dangerous. Um, but the LEDs tend to have wider bandwidths. Laser diodes have more narrow bandwidths, but um, you don't want to point them at people's eyes, so you need to be really careful about that. And they tend to be large and bulky. Um, this is a relatively small one here. You can see it next to a penny, uh, but there's some bigger ones there. But uh, that can be a, a real limitation is that the size of the unit um, gets correspondingly bigger, especially as you need one of these for each uh, light source, so each optode, basically, right? Um, and uh, they also tend to heat up, and so you have more issues with heating, and can you keep the system cool to the point where it's, it's usable and it doesn't just overheat. So you need the light sources, and then you need the light detectors. And again, you've got options, and these are actually similar to the options for PET imaging, uh, because remember, PET, you're measuring photons. The difference is PET, the photons are coming from these uh, positron emission events, and uh, they have a very specific energy uh, that you're recording at, whereas this is more sort of broad-based uh, kind of energy. Um, but regardless, they're using the similar kinds of technologies, which are either photodiodes or photomultiplier tubes. Uh, this is a diagram of a photomultiplier tube that sort of shows how the light comes in, and it's got these things inside the dynodes that basically when one photon hits them, it multiplies. The dynodes multiply the photon and you get multiples. And so you have a, it's almost like a bunch of mirrors, but each one is actually amplifying the signal uh, till the final sensor. The photodiodes um, uh, are a little slower, uh, although these new avalanche photodiodes have similar principles to the photomultiplier tubes and are faster, uh, but they tend to be more expensive uh, as well. So. Um, that's the other side of it, and again, there's different technologies, and different systems will have different ones. Uh, and typically, what you see is that the commercially available systems use somewhat older technology, older but more reliable, uh, whereas the lab-based, more innovative but not commercially available systems are the ones that are using the newer bits of hardware and trying out the latest and greatest kind of stuff. So now we come to this issue that I've, I've touched on a, a few times, which is how we actually do multi-channel imaging and then the, the limitations that come from that. So in this case, what you're seeing is a grid of emitters and detectors. So they're colored different. Um, emitters are red, detectors are blue, or vice versa. I don't know offhand, and the point gets made either way. Uh, so you can see that they're alternating, right? So you imagine that the blue one here is an emitter, and then there's three red detectors around it. Uh, or this blue one, it has four red detectors around it. So the white's coming out through the blue one, goes out in every direction, all those red ones are detecting it. Um, but you've also got multiple emitters. So the problem that you, if you start thinking through this, you very quickly realize that, say this red detector, it's actually receiving light from at least these four different emitters, right? And in order to be able to resolve where the brain activity is occurring, we need to know which of those emitters each photon that arrives at that detector came from. Uh, and so you can't just sort of shine light from everything all at once and record it everywhere and make any sense of it. You need some way of basically tagging the light so that you know where it came from when it gets to that uh, particular detector. Um, so first of all, the, um, with this alternating pattern or with any system, uh, the number of channels is the number of emitters multiplied by the number of detectors, roughly. Um, meaning that, you know, so given this blue one here, in principle, so I, as I said, you've got, you know, 
if this blue one's an emitter, you've got four red ones around it that can receive light. But the ones further away, some of those photons might actually travel further and reach detectors that are further away. Uh, and so each pair of emitter and detector forms a channel or a path through the brain that we can get a signal from. Uh, I say this is uh, sort of approximate because in fact, of course, the ones on the edge, they don't have um, uh, other ones around them. And so they don't, the ones on the edge don't participate in as many channels as the ones that are more surrounded by other optodes. Um, but it's, you know, roughly uh, that kind of math. And also you're limited, uh, so two to three centimeters uh, separation distance between emitters and detectors is about optimal, maybe a little more. Uh, but that does mean that if you have, you know, sort of whole head coverage or very broad head coverage, there may be uh, pairs of emitters and detectors that are just too far away uh, to be useful. And typically you don't put the detectors in, uh, any closer to the emitters than that because there's not a, a lot of point, although there's one reason why you would, which I'll come to. Um, so this problem of how do you actually tag the white is uh, solved by a, a solution called multiplexing. And that basically means that uh, the white is tagged in some particular way. And there are a couple of different ways to do it. The simplest one is time multiplexing, which means that each emitter, each thing that's shining out light, is only on briefly. And so each one's pulsing light and then it turns off. And each, only one emitter is ever on at one time. And so, you know, you'd sort of go in a sequence, like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Each one would be on and then off until it came around to being its turn again. And so that's one of the big limitations on your sampling rate is these things aren't all on at once. And of course, the more emitters you have, the longer it takes to turn each one on and off before you get around to that one again. So that in turn lowers your, your sampling rate. Um, and so knowing the speed of light, you can make predictions about how long it's gonna take, you know, between the time that emitter's on and the time the light travels uh, the two to three centimeter path through the brain and back out and just sample from the detectors sort of define that at this time window the detector must be detecting light from this emitter at this next time window it's detecting from that emitter and and so on. Um, another one is frequency multiplexing so when you have a, a frequency domain system that's modulating the light intensity come to that in a minute um, you can actually have them uh, modulating at different frequencies and so you've got some light that's going at a higher frequency some that's going at a lower frequency and so the emitter or sorry the detectors would be detecting light from multiple emitters at the same time but you can do a Fourier decomposition and break down the intensity of light at the different frequencies and you know which emitter it came from just based on on the frequency there so there's a couple of different techniques. Um, that obviously helps with your sampling rate, but there, there's still limitations on sampling rate. So this is uh, uh, from a study where they systematically changed and manipulated the distance between emitter and detector and uh, recorded and also modeled uh, how the light traveled uh, through the head and sort of the extent of, to, to which it was concentrated in different areas. And so what you're seeing is each thing, so there's a, a emitter separator distance going from 0, 5, 10, 15, all the way up to 55 millimeters apart, so five and a half centimeters. White and yellow are the highest uh, amounts of light um, received, and then it sort of drops off. So orange is weaker signal, red is, is the weakest yet still detectable kind of signal. So the first thing to notice is that until you get the separation of at least a centimeter, you're not really penetrating into the brain at all. And to get, uh, you know, at least sort of orangey, you know, so reasonably good signal strength, you need your emitter uh, detector distance to be at least three centimeters. Uh, so again, this sort of, they say two to three, right, is ideal. So there's two, you're getting some penetration, three, you're getting better. And in fact, you know, going up to four or five, you're actually getting uh, somewhat better penetration although maybe a little less sensitivity in the middle between the two, uh, as opposed to like two or three where you get pretty good sensitivity uh, all the way through that path. Um, and so again, with some systems where you've got enough optodes, you can actually be looking at multiple distances. So you can have like two centimeter and four centimeter distances uh, to get more signal there. Uh, the other thing to notice is that it's not just about sort of how much is going through the cortex, but in fact, you get deeper penetration as you have these things farther apart. So the signal's relatively weak, uh, 
but some of those photons are actually going through relatively deep paths uh, as opposed to just that really shallow path that I talked about before. Um, so there is some value to having the, these wider separations. Uh, and the ideal thing is to have multiple separations in as many optodes as you can and uh, have ways of sort of recovering the signal from diff different ones. Uh, and as I'll talk about later, this optical tomography is where you do source localization and really try and figure out the strength of the sig signal at each point in the brain. Coming back to the simplest form of near-infrared imaging, which is the continuous wave approach. And this is the closest to what's traditionally done in spectrophotometry, which is still a technique that's used in, in chemistry. Uh, so you're shining a light at a continuous intensity of a specific waveform or wavelength. And as you can see in this diagram, so IO is the intensity of the light coming in. It goes through the tissue or whatever sample. And as you might expect, as you're shining light through something, some light is absorbed or scattered, so not all the light gets through. And so if we measure the intensity of the light coming out, it's going to be lower, and it's actually going to be lower in proportion to the concentration. Uh, so, you know, a very simple analogy is if you think about coffee, if you make a really weak cup of coffee, put it in a, a clear glass mug, you're going to be able to see right through it and decide not to drink it, probably. Uh, and then if you brew a really strong coffee, you're going to hold up that same mug and it's going to look really dark and, you know, very little light is going to pass through. So that's just because the concentration of coffee stuff, little coffee particles, is higher in the second case and so less light passes through. So that's the simple principle. So in the case of near-infrared imaging, the sample is not a coffee cup, it's your head. And what's causing the decrease in light is all the stuff inside your head. But if we shine in a light of a specific known wavelength, and that's tuned to be, be sensitive to oxy-deoxy hemoglobin, then what we're measuring is the concentration in principle of the oxy and deoxy hemoglobin. In practice, it's not just that, as you know, very little thought is required to realize that there's more than just blood in your head, right? Um, now, of course, choosing that wavelength such that things like water are not affected by it or affecting it I is one thing, but there's still various things that are affecting it. And so there's sort of simplifying assumptions that are made that, uh, in fact, uh, and that's down at the bottom, um, we assume a homogeneous medium. So we sort of treat it as if it's one homogeneous thing, even though the concentration of different things like blood and cells and all that actually varies in, in different ways uh, throughout the head. Um, so the, the math is uh, relatively simple because it's sort of the ratio of the input to output light intensity um, as a function of the volume. Uh, and another way of conceptualizing that is the path length. And so in near-infrared imaging, that path length is basically the distance from the emitter to the detector following the, that banana-shaped path that we expect it to travel through the head. Again, an issue about that is that there's not one specific path. There's sort of a variety of shallower and deeper paths that that light uh, can go through. And so we have to make some sort of simplifying assumption there. Um, and uh, in particular with continuous wave uh, NERI, there's no way of directly measuring that. With other ways, there actually are ways of, of getting a measurement of the path length. So you could use that. Uh, but all of these things basically contribute to uncertainty and essentially ultimately noise uh, in the signal. So that's kind of the downside and where, although this is sort of like, you know, uh, a cheap version of fMRI, the signal is much less reliable because, you know, we're only getting 3% of the light through and we're having to make all these simplifying assumptions about what the light's doing and how that relates to the concentration. And in fact, some of these things like differential path length and transmittance seem to vary across individuals, uh, in particular as a function of age, but possibly as a function of other things as well. And so the numbers that you choose as sort of simplifying assumptions or that are made in the software may be more accurate for some people than for other people. And that's just the nature of it. Uh, the next approach is frequency modulation. And so here, rather than shining the light uh, with continuous intensity, you're actually modulating the intensity at a very high rate. Uh, so uh, 100 to 500 megahertz, megahertz being millions of, of cycles per second. Uh, so, so very fast modulations, um, but light travels fast, so it sort of works in proportion. 
Uh, and what we do is we measure, so down at the bottom you can see, so the light intensity has been modulated as a sine wave passes through the tissue, and the intensity is reduced, same as continuous wave, but critically the phase or the timing of those peaks is also shifted. So because it has to travel through this uh, medium that has stuff in it like blood, um, it's actually sort of, ah, shoot. It's experiencing uh, a bit of a time delay as it goes through. And that time delay relates, or the phase delay relates to um, how far it's traveled and how deeply uh, it's traveled. And so what we do is we measure the, not only just the intensity of the light coming out, but the phase, so the timing of those peaks, and compare that to what we call a reference phase, which is where you shine, you basically split the beam of light. So one part of the beam is going through the head, and we're measuring the output there, and another beam is not going through the head at all, but it's just going sort of in a, a straight path uh, through a, a known distance, you know, like a little fiber optic basically, to a detector, and we're measuring the phase of that. So that's our reference to know for the light traveling you know, this specific distance, this is the phase delay. And so if we compare the measured phase delay through the head to that reference, you can tell sort of how much further it went, how much slower the, the phase is than uh, the, the sort of reference. Uh, and so you can make uh, calculations around the distance and the timing as well. Uh, and so this is critical for measuring the fast optical signal. So with the continuous wave, there's really no timing information. You just get this intensity information. So there'd no way, be no way to get fast changes. You basically would see slow changes in that uh, continuous wave. But with this, you can actually use the phase delay to get very high precision uh, timing and do that, that uh, event-related stuff. So frequency modulation. Um, so in the commercial systems that are available, frequency and continuous wave are both uh, available. Frequency tends to be a more expensive option, uh, a little less available, but it's, it's definitely out there and, as I say, um, essential for doing the, the fast optical signal if you want to do that. Finally, uh, time domain uh, imaging is also, so frequency and time domain imaging both have good temporal resolution. Uh, time domain imaging is done slightly differently though. So rather than shining a continuous light and modulating its intensity, we're actually just sending very, very brief uh, pulses of light. And by brief, I mean we're measuring on the order of picoseconds. Uh, so you've heard of nanoseconds, which are really tiny bits of a second. Picoseconds are really tiny bits of nanoseconds. Uh, but again, because light travels so fast, we can, we can do this sort of thing. Um, time domain imaging is tricky to do technically because you need uh, diodes, uh, lasers, or, or LEDs that have that really high temporal precision to be able to turn it on and off that quickly. And you also need light detectors that are really sensitive because you're in a, a, a sort of picosecond level pulse of light. You're not sending that much light in. And so you need very sensitive detectors that can detect really down to the level of individual photons and be counting individual photons or light particles uh, to be able to do this kind of measurement. So you send in the light as an impulse. So it is sort of on and off for a very brief period of time, goes through the tissue through some distance. And you're doing this lots of times, right? So you're pulsing, pulsing, pulsing lots of, uh, uh, of these pulses. And what you record is something that looks like this, which we call a temporal point spread function. And what that means is the probabilistically the, those individual photons are going to arrive at your detector at different times, uh, not all at the same time, uh, because some are going to go through shallower paths, some through, through deeper paths. Uh, and so the, the temporal point spread function is basically the distribution of timing of all those photons when they arrive at the detector. And what's advantageous about this is that um, you can look, uh, this is slightly confusing because they've overlaid uh, two lines. Uh, the blue is actually the reference function. So again, that's going through, not through the head, but just through a, a fiber optic as sort of, this is the, the normal distribution of photon uh, transfer times. The red is what we really care about, which is the ones that went through the head and uh, we detected. So the mean TOF, TOF is time of flight, so how long it took the, the photon to go from the emitter to the detector. The mean is the peak, so that's sort of obvious, the average. Uh, but what this means is that we can sort of separate out the photons that arrived later from the photons that arrived earlier. 
And in principle, we know that the photons that arrived earlier probably didn't go through the brain. They probably went through the superficial tissues uh, to get there faster. And so we can actually separate out the signal from the light that went through the superficial tissues and the light that went through the brain. Whereas in the other techniques, all we know is that light went into the head and it came out of the head. And it, you know, attenuated the, the, the intensity or the, the phase by some amount. Um, but we don't really know where, whether, how much of that light went through the brain and how much of it went through the superficial tissues. Uh, whereas with the time domain, you can make that distinction. Now it's still a bit of a guess, um, but the assumption is that, and, and assumption based on some empirical evidence, is that most of the photons would go through the, uh, the shallow path. And so we can basically assume that at least sort of the mean or even a bit past the mean, all those photons, they didn't go through the brain. So we could just ignore them. And we can look at specifically the intensity and timing of the signal of those photons that arrived later and make the assumption that those are the ones that went through the brain. And so it's, it sort of gives you a cleaner signal in that way and also gives you a certain amount of temporal precision as well because you assume the ones that arrived much later are the ones that sort of went deeper uh, through the, the tissue. And there's actually a, um, an interesting application of this which, uh, where they've done what they call zero separation emitter detector uh, measurements. And so with time domain imaging, you can just aim the optode straight down into the head, shoot the light in, and record the light coming back out from that same point. So the light's going to go in every direction, but some's actually going to go down and, and back out. Um, and so in principle, first of all, they've shown that this works. So in principle, other constraints notwithstanding, you could actually end up with very high spatial resolution optical imaging because you don't need that like two to three centimeter uh, separation between the emitter and the detector. And what I didn't really elaborate on before is if you have that two to three centimeter separation distance, that really limits your spatial resolution, right? Because all you know is the light went through two to three centimeters of tissue, came out the other side, and so we've got kind of a chunk of tissue that we're getting a signal from that's reasonably large. Um, whereas if we have lots of these zero uh, distance uh, sensors, then we could have very high spatial resolution because we're sort of just getting the, the light from the, the part of the brain right underneath that sensor. So that has potential. But again, these time domain systems, uh, oh, and it, because it's got the good temporal resolution, you can also do the, the Eros type uh, imaging. Um, but the, the time domain stuff is really only in the realm of custom built solutions in labs that have a lot of expertise. Uh, and generally these are labs that are much more focused on the technical development and have engineers and physicists and this sort of thing, and physiologists, and not ones who are doing sort of routine cognitive neuroscience research with these techniques. It's still at the, the very early stages of just mastering the technique and, and getting it to work. So optical tomography is basically the source localization approach uh, to doing near-infrared imaging. Uh, so given that we've got lots of channels from all our emitters and detectors, we've got light passing through different parts of the brain. So we can, you know, at a simple level, just like EEG, just look at the signals from each of those channels over time. But we can also do the source localization and model where you know, given that we assume the sort of banana-shaped path, we know how far apart the emitter and the detector were, we can basically look at the signal under each of those spots and do this sort of reconstructive 3D model of the brain. Of course, limited in depth, but that's, that's uh, just a limitation of the technique. Uh, generally, this re relies on, and here I say time domain, but I really mean time or frequency domain uh, systems. Time domain are, are somewhat better for it. Um, and they're all based, again, like uh, source localization in EEG or MEG, we're trying to solve an inverse problem, right? So given the signals that we record, where in the brain are they coming from? Um, but the way we solve it is by modeling the forward problem which is to say, if we know kind of the, the expected paths of light through, um, given, you know, sort of different depths of penetration uh, of the light, this is what kind of signal we would expect to get out of it. Um, so if we have a, a model of how the light goes through the head, then we can estimate um, where the activation is occurring based on our measurements. Um, this obviously then depends on how good a model can we create of how light travels through the head. And again, like EEG, MEG source localization, you can have very simple models, like imagine the head's a sphere, 
and there's just kind of one layer and the light's going through it and you can model light transmittance of that. Or you can get fancy and do these finite element or boundary element models where, uh, remember the boundary element models are basically modeling each surface, so scalp, skull, meninges, CSF, brain. Uh, and the finite element models are modeling not just the surface but the thickness of the surface. And so you're going to have better precision there at the expense of much more complicated uh, calculations. Ideally, you're using the anatomical MRI from the individual for this because every individual is going to have a different shaped head and a different thickness of skull and, and all that kind of stuff. And then you just come up with models of how light of given wavelengths transmits uh, through these different tissues and use those to build the, the computational model. And so this is an example of uh, the forward solution. So calculating the photon migration profiles are basically modeling how photons given a source at one point, how many of these photons are likely to go at each sort of depth through the head between the emitter and the, the detector. So the arrows are showing you the emitter and the detector. The brain sort of schematically shown in green and this is showing the intensity and then here they're doing a frequency domain uh, thing so it's measuring the phase shift. So it's modeling the amount of phase shift and so you can see the amount of phase shift gets increased the deeper the photons go as you might expect. Um, and you can measure both the absorption of light and the amount of scattering. So some light's going to be absorbed, meaning it never comes back out. Other light's going to bounce around off the different things inside the head and eventually come out. But the thing to keep in mind there is it's not necessarily sort of that straight arc from the emitter to the detector um, because the scattering is going to cause it to have a, an actually increased functional path length relative to that uh, shortest possible distance. Um, and this is basically just an example of what, what those models would look like. Um, so that's the tomographic. I'm going to come back to that. Um, these, I think I probably should put the slide at a different point, but that's okay. Uh, so this is comparing optical and bold signal. And this actually, okay, I understand now because this is relating to the next slides. Um, so this is uh, kind of an important consideration if we think this is like a cheaper way to do fMRI-like imaging, how similar is the optical signal to the bold signal in terms of it, like its timing, uh, source localization, and that's a good way to validate these source localization methods is to do fMRI at the same time and see if our optical tomography results align with our fMRI results. Uh, so first of all, looking at time course, here what you're seeing is a couple of different examples. I think they're different subjects. Um, yeah, and uh, in this case, you, the black line is the bold signal, so the fMRI signal. And then the red line's the oxyhemoglobin near F near e signal. And the blue is the deoxyhemoglobin F near e signal. And you can see that they both correlate pretty well. Uh, these numbers here are actually the correlation values. So the oxyhemoglobin correlates better than the deoxyhemoglobin signal uh, with the, the bold response, which kind of makes sense because our understanding of the bold response is that it's largely driven by the increases in oxygenated blood that are delivered to different brain areas. So it kind of makes sense that the oxyhemoglobin signal would be stronger and therefore give you a better correlation. Um, and this is just showing um, different things. And, and that's particularly prevalent in areas where this is a boxcar design, right? So you've seen these sort of modulations on and off as opposed to an area that's not showing systematic modulation. So an area that's not involved in this where the bold and um, sorry, the oxy and deoxy signals uh, correlate fairly similarly. Um, so it's really you're seeing a stronger correlation when there's actual functional activation going on in that brain area. Um, so that's a nice first validation is when we look at the time course, the F near signals look like the fMRI signals, which is great. Then, you know, how do they, how do they localize? So these are the results from a study where they did four different uh, functional localizer tasks. Uh, finger tapping, uh, NOG is go, no go. So that's a response inhibition kind of task. Um, I love these abbreviations, JLO, um, which is judgment of line orientation. Uh, so just judging line orientation as it sounds. So more of a perceptual task. Uh, and then VIS, which I think was just like, uh, was it visual working memory? Visual spatial and back, yeah, so a visual working memory task. Um, in all cases, they chose uh, tasks that they expected to activate sort of parietal slash motor areas 
and uh, superior frontal areas because that's where their optical imaging sensors, they had you know, one of these limited arrays and that's where they were putting it. So they didn't want to do like auditory tasks or simple visual tasks that would activate parts of the cortex that they weren't able to get the optical signals from. Uh, and then they did fMRI uh, at the same time. So, and again, because these are just uh, fiber optics and it's all plastic, there's no interference between the fMRI and the, the optical imaging. And what you can see, the bottom is the fMRI results, um, thresholded and, and mass just so they're clean. Um, so that's kind of our reference, right, in terms of what the activation, quote unquote, should look like uh, for these different tasks, which is, you know, again, they're all activating similar-ish areas. Um, they're all definitely activating parietal, some more frontal, some less frontal. And then the top row is the deoxy uh, FNERI signal, and then the middle row is the oxy FNERI signal. Uh, and first take home message, they kind of line up. Yay. Uh, so it seems like FNERI is actually measuring more or less the same thing as, as bold, uh, FMRI bold, that is. Not consistently though, so like in the go no go task, the oxy hemoglobin signal doesn't really give us anything, although the deoxy does, even though, as I showed you in the time course, the deoxy is actually maybe a little weaker correlated. Um, in judgment of line orientation, it seems like the at least the parietal activation it's it's detectable, but it's it's relatively low compared to fMRI, and that's kind of consistent, right? The fMRI blobs tend to look a bit bigger and more diffuse than the the optical ones. Um, in the visual end back, you actually get maybe a bit more parietal activation for the oxy than the deoxy. Uh, so in all cases, the the sort of simple answer is yes, FNERI does seem to give us similar patterns of activation to FRI bold, um, but maybe not as robust. And that suggests that you know across individuals, you might have more variability, weaker signal. Um, so if you had the choice and you had the money, you'd probably still want to do fMRI. But if you had reasons to do FNERI, at least you can be kind of assured that the signals you're getting are, are believable and validated. Um, this is another consideration though. And so here what they did is they just measured the distance between the scalp and the brain and plotted that as a color map on the outside of the head. Uh, so from fMRI, or not fMRI, but anatomical MRI, you can obviously see the skull and the scalp and the brain, and so you can make these quantifications of how far the skull is away from the brain. And obviously the farther the, the, the brain is away from the skull, the weaker your FNERI signal is going to be because that light's got to travel further before it ever hits the cortex. So less light's actually penetrating the cortex and generating a signal. And so it turns out that the greatest distance between the brain and the skull is over kind of the back top of your head, so your superior parietal lobe kind of areas, um, which may explain in that last figure why there was a little more variability in the parietal activations. And the closest distance from the brain to the skull is over the forehead. So again, those systems that concentrate the nearest sensors over the, the forehead um, are kind of a winning situation because you don't have hair and the brain's actually closer to your sensors there than it is anywhere else. So if you want to do frontal lobe imaging, FNERI is, is definitely a, a good option there. And then other stuff sort of middling in the middle. But that does, you know, beyond the fact that it sort of means frontal lobe you get good signal, parietal lobe it doesn't, it means that you might have more variable signal across the head, right? So if you're imagining a, a situation where you might have frontal and parietal activations, um, you might see more intensity of activation in frontal than parietal regions, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the frontal lobe is more strongly activated than the parietal lobe. It just means that your sensors are closer to the brain, so you have a, a better signal to noise ratio. Uh, and then this is, uh, again, continuing from the same paper, uh, so here they're actually showing the distribution. So each of those circles is now one of those optodes and where it's located on the head. And so they actually had uh, two separate arrays that they put one over the parietal and one over the frontal, um, which explains their, their signal. And uh, they're measuring here, they're, or, or representing with the color, the contrast to noise ratio, or which is sort of like signal to noise ratio, but it's basically like your experimental contrast. So how much signal do you detect between your control and your experimental conditions um, relative to the background noise. And um, here you're seeing that that tends to be highest over areas where there's activation. Um, but the other thing is that uh, sort of on the whole, it seems like there's probably more variability in contrast to noise ratio across the head for FNERI relative to, to bold. 
where different tasks were given different contrast to noise ratio uh, measurements, but there's sort of a, a bigger spectrum of you know dark blue to red in the FNERI results than the bold results. So again, we're getting signal from the brain. It seems believable. It seems consistent with bold, but it's a little more variable, a little weaker, uh, and so. And, and this is actually the same, um, you know, as I would have told you for bold fMRI, is that any of these techniques is valid for measuring signal within a given brain area, but it becomes more dangerous to sort of try and make relative comparisons of the signal strength between different brain areas. Because even with fMRI bold, that signal strength is driven by the bold response, which is very sort of unrelated or distantly related to the electrical or functional changes. And so just differences in biochemical pathways or the amount of vessels or something can affect the bold response. So comparing different areas can be dangerous there. In FNERI, it's sort of amplified by the fact that you've got variable scalp brain distances and uh, this sort of thing. Uh, so again, it's, you know, if you're getting activation in an area, that's believable, but be suspicious of relative quantification of activation between different brain areas. Uh, da, da, da. Okay. There. That's kind of funny. I have a safety slide, but nothing on it. Uh, it's a very safe technique. That's why I have nothing on it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, really it is, though. Uh, as I said, like the big danger is that if the white intensity is too high, you risk heating the brain and eventually uh, burning the brain. But, uh, you know, when people are building these systems, certainly the commercial ones have all gone through medical device certification and uh, are validated. Uh, and in the labs where they're doing this kind of development, they're very cognizant of these risks and they're doing the calculations uh, to measure this. So um, uh, it's quite safe. And the only real danger then becomes if you're using the laser diodes, you don't want to point them at somebody's eye because that can cause brain, da or brain damage eye damage. Uh, but that's no different than a laser pointer, right? And people use laser pointers all the time. Uh, so uh, it is quite a safe technique in that way. And even safer than fMRI, because with fMRI or any MRI technique, you have all these contra contraindications around the MRI scanner. So you can't have metal near it. You can't have people that have metal in them potentially going in there and, and being injured. So it's quite a safe technique. Um, so just to sort of wrap up, uh, FNERI is certainly much cheaper uh, and more convenient than fMRI or MEG. Um, so it's not like a multi-million dollar system, doesn't require ongoing sort of costs of, of liquid helium or things to keep the magnets super cooled. Uh, you can measure multiple variables, so fast signal and slow signal. And even in the slow, you can get oxy and deoxyhemoglobin uh, separately in total hemoglobin. For functional imaging, that may be less attractive. Um, but in physiological studies or disease states, that might actually become a more interesting uh, kind of uh, advantage there. Uh, it's easily combined with pretty much any other neuroimaging technique um, because it's you know, sort of orthogonal. There's no radio waves. There's no electro signal, there's no magnetic fields, any of that. So it's highly compatible with different uh, kinds of techniques. And for babies and, and little kids, it's relatively insensitive to head movement. So compared to EEG, it's a preferable technique and is, is probably widely used there more than other ones. The other real advantage to, to doing it in kids is that babies have relatively thin skulls. Right? And so you actually get a better signal to noise ratio in babies than you would with adults just because you're getting more light in. You have to be more cognizant of the, of the white levels, but again, the levels are quite safe. Uh, so there's really no risk to the babies there. Limitations, so the, the signal to noise ratio, actually I should just sort of not qualify that by for fast signal. The SNR is, is relatively low. Um, and so from a, like an experimental perspective, what that likely means is you probably need more trials uh, to get good signal and you may be less sensitive to relatively small changes in brain activity. That's something like fMRI uh, might show you. Um, so you might want to design sort of at least at first really strong contrasts between your stimuli to drive that effect. Uh, the spatial resolution is inherently low unless you're doing super fancy cutting edge time domain zero separation distance. You're really looking at sort of three centimeter ish chunks of, of tissue. Um, and so it's, it's called diffuse optical imaging for a reason. It's, it's diffuse and relatively low uh, spatial resolution and limited depth. 
Um, of course, that low spatial resolution is also a limitation of something like EEG or MEG, although it's probably more pronounced with, with FNERI than it is with EEG or MEG. Uh, and then you have these issues around things like hair um, optode movement, which is really solved by good sort of mechanical design of, of the headset, uh, and the issues around measuring physiological artifacts, and uh, especially like these peripheral blood flow and things like that. Um, so it's certainly not a perfect technique, but it has a lot of promise. Um, on the other hand, there are still a lot of unknowns and assumptions. And again, because relatively few people are working in this field compared to fMRI, the progress just occurs more slowly. It's steady, but it's slow. Uh, so we still don't know really what are the optimal wavelengths, uh, if those are different for fast versus slow signals. Um, we don't fully understand the light scattering properties of tissue or how we would more accurately measure that on a case-by-case -case or individual basis as opposed to making some measurements and sort of generalizing those to every individual. Uh, the fact that we're making these simplifying assumptions about the homogeneity of the tissue even when it's not. So could we actually be using M uh, like anatomical MRI scans to get more estimation of uh, the actual tissue composition? possibly. Uh, crosstalk, which is the issue of how do you separate uh, the white from different emitters at each uh, detector. Um, one thing I didn't really touch on in the lecture, but I'll, I'll mention it now, and then I have, is uh, again, this is blood flow based. And so if your heart rate changes or if your blood pressure is different, that's going to affect the signals uh, as well. Um, uh, that in many cases is probably not so much of an issue because in a lot of studies you're just kind of sitting there, but if you're doing any kind of physical activity that might uh, be a significant consideration. Um, and another one that again is a, a solvable problem but a, a, a worthwhile consideration is how consistently are you putting those optodes in the same locations on the head. Uh, so if you're using something like an EEG cap, at least you're using a 10-20 system based uh, kind of approach. And so, and you're going to have different caps for different size heads. So you're going to have relatively consistent positioning. Um, but for source localization, that can be an issue. And so the ideal thing would be put the cap on, put the optodes on, and then get some sort of scan of the head. So you can actually tell where each optode is uh, on the head. Um, so that can be done in different ways. The probably most straightforward way, but expensive, is to put it on and then stick them in the MRI and get an MRI scan. And then you've got their anatomical MRI as well, which is good for source localization, and you have uh, accurate position of each optode relative to that. Um, otherwise, you can use things like they use with EEG or MEG, which is like the, um, the OptiTrack device where it's, you're tapping each sensor and creating a, a 3D digitization of the outer surface of the head that you can then later co-register with an anatomical MRI either from that person or sort of use something like um, the MRI-based co-registration to warp the shape of that digitization to a standard template if you don't have a, an anatomical MRI for that particular individual. Um, yeah, and that is all that we have for optical imaging. <laughs>